Welcome everybody to Sing Ray's webinar of the month. This month we're talking about photographing forest scenes with creeks and waterfalls with Gary Randall. A little bit about Gary. He's been a professional photographer for over 20 years. Um, he is an award-winning professional photographer, artist, writer, traveler, and adventure seeker. He lives in the foothills of the south side of Mount Hood, Oregon. He has been a lifelong resident of all sides of Mount Hood and the Columbia River Gorge and has spent his life exploring outdoors. Taking photos has been a passion of his since he was about six years old and was given a brownie Hawkeye. Um, he bought his first 35 millimeter when he joined the US Navy and immediately wanted to learn how to develop his own photos. He started, he joined a camera club and started spending hours at a time in a dark room, learning new techniques from the old guys that were willing to teach what they knew. Since digital photography has come into play, he has developed uh, into a high quality method. It has allowed him the ability to do many of the dark room processing techniques that he learned in the past, plus a lot more, all with the lights on. Throughout the last 15 years, his digital photography has developed to a point where he just recognizes some of the best in the Pacific Northwest region of the United States and is starting to be recognized on the world stage. Uh, he has um, been featured in books, magazines, TV, websites, and blogs. He's been recognized for his work, both for photography and volunteer work in his community, including the Clackamas County Marketing Innovation Award, Volunteer of the Year Award from the Mount Hood Cultural Center and Museum. And he was a recognized artist of the year in 2014 by the Mount Hood Chamber of Commerce. Gary is also a writer and a public speaker. He hosts uh, photography work workshops and groups and excursions. And we are just so happy to have him here with us tonight. So Gary, I'm gonna let you take it from here and I'll let you know if we get some questions along the way. All right, great. Thank you everybody for showing up. And I'm just like you, I'm just some guy with a camera that enjoys what he's doing. And I've dedicated a lot of time to it. So I appreciate everybody showing up today. So, um, First thing I'd like to do is kind of go over what I plan on doing here. If I can get my slideshow to work. So tonight we're going to talk about uh, composition, trying to find order in some of the chaotic forests that we might find ourselves in and talk about the time of the day. We'll talk about lightness, darkness in the forest and how to use it to create depth and mood. We'll talk about using uh, the weather and uh, the best settings for waterfalls and creeks as well as forests uh, are tools that we will use. And I'll go over a little bit of uh, the processing that I use in uh, processing the photos that I take in the forest. Okay, all right. And this is going to be pretty basic because I started out, it seems, when I first started taking photographs, uh, digital landscape photographs, that it seemed like I was a lot more complicated in the process that I was using because it seemed like I was trying to correct what I wasn't able to do in the field in post-processing on the computer afterwards. So as time goes by and my photography got better out in the field, uh, it took less time to process and my processing wasn't as extensive. So, so I feel it's very important to try to find uh, and capture the best photo you can out in the field. So the best thing to do is to try to learn your settings. So you're not out there guessing you're deliberate in what you're doing. You go out, you set up, you understand what kind of settings that you're going to need. You find the composition, you find your focus, and you check your histogram to make sure that you've got a proper exposure, and then you can move on to another photograph. So, all right, let's talk about lenses first, okay? I'm going to talk about ultra wide angle lenses, a 24 to 70 and a 70 to 200. If you're using a crop sensor, these will be a little different. It's the uh, um, Normal landscape lens for a crop sensor would be probably a 18 to 55 and a 55 to 200, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, let me see, then we'll talk about, um, and this is all in, in uh, how it applies to composition. So 
we're going to have uh, talk about uh, what to look for in the forest to try to establish a good composition. I also cover vertical and horizontal orientation of your camera. All right, so let's move on to uh, what we like to look for out in the forest. You may come across, uh, because we're a lot of times we're on trails, you may find man-made objects that kind of make your photograph a little bit more interesting. In this, these particular instances, we've got a bridge, we've got an old dilapidated, dilapidated building, another little bridge through the forest and a fence. You never know what you're gonna come across. And sometimes man-made objects will be able to make the photograph unique, kind of will tell a story. A lot of times, especially if this, if it's an old building uh, or something from the past, it'll kind of create a story that'll become the subject about something that's in, in the forest itself. A lot of times you can find old cars or fences or even the trails and the pathways that we walk through. A lot of times a pathway can be a nice lead in into a beautiful forest photo. Okay. All right. Let's move on to the next. All right. We, uh, in composition, throughout the forest, you can find different ponds, lakes, reflections sometimes in standing water. Uh, the creeks that we find in the forest create beautiful leading lines. We'll sometimes find unique trees. This little vine maple in the lower right-hand corner here, he looks like he's the old man of the forest, and he's got moss all over him. He's got a real interesting story to tell, so we made him a subject. In this photograph up on the right hand side, we I put a uh, fern down here to fill in the, the foreground because there wasn't a whole lot interesting down there. On the uh, other side, I used a vertical format. Vertical format is going to show more depth in your photo because it's going to show more uh, of the of what's at your feet. So it's going to show more of the foreground. And so it's going to be more of a, it's going to show more depth throughout the photo. And that's when I typically will use a vertical format is if there's something interesting in the foreground that I want to be the subject. I love if the way I'm, that shot really leads your eye to the back too. It, it kind of pulls you in. A lot of people would ignore a, a log like this and try to shoot around it when really it's a, it could be a leading line. You also have to consider that creeks are leading lines as well. So when you're in a forest and you're photographing creeks, those are our leading lines, as well as uh, in a, a, uh, a waterfall, that could be a line as well. Creek that goes from the foreground into the background to a waterfall as well. So, so we're trying to create an interesting subject. We're trying to anchor a foreground. We're trying to create sometimes the subject in the foreground. So, okay, let's move on. Hope that works for y'all. Okay, all right. It's been a while since I've done PowerPoint. This is pretty cool. I have to remember to do this for my other presentations sometimes. So, all right, let's move on with our composition. A lot of times we aren't necessarily looking for depth leading lines. Sometimes we're looking for patterns in the forest. We're looking for some sort of rhythm or texture in the forest. And sometimes we're just not looking for anything more than a single plane of focus. A lot of times we can create a single plane of focus with something that's actually quite deep, like the forest. But if it's a line of trees, sometimes the viewer really is only noticing the first line of trees. And after that, the rest kind of fades into the background. So don't discount um, zooming in, using your 70 to 200 to move in on a scene, to be able to eliminate everything except for what you want inside your photograph. Uh, don't uh, discount abstracts, semi-abstracts patterns and designs um, a lot of times your 70 to 200 will work very well for those and i like zooms i started with primes way back in the old days 
and your feet had to be your zoom this particular case in this day and age all the zoom lenses are just absolutely incredible in their sharpness and their focus and so i don't hesitate at all using a, a, a zoom lens so my method with a zoom lens typically is to start wide and then to uh, then to zoom in to the scene move it up or down left or right move it in or out until i've eliminated everything and compacted the scene and just put in the scene just what I want. And that's uh, typically what I will do with a ultra wide angle lens. A lot of times people will buy a ultra wide angle lens and photograph territorial views or very wide, wide angle views where most cases when I'm using an ultra wide angle lens, I'm getting close to a subject and not far away from it. A good example would be a creek or even a waterfall where I'm in the creek, very close to a waterfall, and I'm trying to show the, the waterfall in a very powerful way or the creek in a very powerful way. I'm making it the subject. And so a ultra wide angle lens many times will make things look very small if you're very far away or at all. So what I like to do is I like to use them and get close to my subjects. Many times the foreground is what I'm getting close to. So Gary, your f-stop is very low, 2.8 to 3.5, which means a shallow depth of field, but your photo looks in focus further out. Can you explain how you select the depth of field? Well, let me see. In this particular case, in the upper left-hand corner, we don't have a lot in our uh, minimum focus distance on the lens. And so we're reaching out there quite a ways. And in this particular case, I was most likely going for uh, a, uh, a, let me think here. I was trying to go for probably a faster exposure because I was hand holding the photograph or the camera. So I would most likely try to stop down in a particular case like that. But if you think about it in this upper left-hand corner, you're not looking at a real deep um, depth of focus with this particular Oops, let me go back to that one. You aren't looking at a real deep depth of focus where you have a close foreground and a very distant uh, subject in the very back. So you can get away with opening your aperture up a little bit more. You can notice everything is focused in that. So, and that was quite a, quite a ways away. It was a long ways away. I would say that was maybe even a quarter of a mile away from where I was standing. So you can get away with that if you're reaching out and not necessarily dealing with a deep depth of field okay well, and then someone else said those are not the apertures at which the photos were taken they're the maximum apertures of the lens used well in this particular case you're right i'm not even paying attention so let me bring <laughs> up what my settings were <laughs> all right oh. let's look at this photograph here and i'm gonna uh, get this little box out of the way so i can see what i'm doing and then this particular photograph Thanks for pointing that out because I'm just rolling with this. Um, I'm looking at the details. And in that particular case, it's still a fairly open aperture. I was looking at 4.8 and uh, 1 800th of a second because I was hand holding it. And my ISO was 2000. And I was shooting with the D3 back then. That was quite a ways, quite a while ago. But yeah, I was probably trying to um, uh, quicken my shutter. So, because I was hand holding it, so I opened up my aperture and I'd already raised my ISO to 2000. So that was probably why I relied on the aperture at that point. Okay. So that kind of explains why that was using such an open aperture. Now let's look at some of these other ones here. The one in the lower left hand corner, that one is another one where I wasn't standing real close and I was zooming out to it. And that one was uh, F6.3. And that was another handheld photograph. And further on in my discussion, I'll talk about um, handheld handheld photographs and when I can you can use a, a tripod or handheld handhold them. So okay. So if anybody has any questions at all about the settings in these, I have the uh, settings right here. So it just takes me a, a minute or two to look at them. So. And uh, the one at the lower right-hand corner, that was another one where it's f4.5. And in that 
that photograph, if you were to look at it larger, you would notice that the focus falls off into the back. But I kind of use that as an effect to be able to separate the front from the back of the photograph. So. And what uh, time was, of day did you shoot these? That one in particular was a uh, quarter to nine, eight forty-three in the morning. So it was after after sunrise, and so I had good light. So you'll um, you'll notice that a lot of these photographs that are like this, I'm usually holding my seventy to two hundred and reaching out there and hand holding these a lot of times i'm reaching around and i'm moving around and trying to find that composition by eye and then taking the photograph so i i only use a, a tripod unless i need to and a lot of times the tripod is used in every particular instance in a, taking a photograph and i feel that if i have a fast enough shutter speed and I've got a good focus, then I like to hand hold my photographs or my camera when I'm taking It seems to be a real personal preference among photographers. Some photographers just want to have their hands on the camera all the time. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it, landscape photographers in, in particular, they rely on their tripod a lot because it's a platform for their camera. So they can put their camera on their tripod and then they can just, landscape photographers don't get in a hurry. They're not like wildlife photographers where they've got this uh, certain amount of uh, energy where they're trying to move quickly, stay with their subject and get a nice focus and get a shot. A landscape photographer, they, you know, even when they're in a hurry, it's usually because the sun's, it's, the sunset's there and it's changing, and, but you still got at least maybe five minutes or so. You're not talking about seconds. So a lot of times, a landscape photographer will set their camera up on a tripod just to have a platform so they can scratch their head and think about it and set their settings and play with their composition and use their shutter release and get that that photograph just right so but like i said before if you know there are times when a, uh, a landscape photographer will need to focus stack their photo if that's the case they're going to want to make sure that it's on there there may be times when they need a bracket for exposure. So they're going to make sure that it's on a tripod. So, so usually it's more than just um, choice. A lot of times you really need to do it, but there's times when you really don't need to. So, all right. All right. Did I cover everything here? All right. Composition patterns, vertical orientation. So let's move on to, uh, uh time of day all right i like taking photographs any time of the day and of course sweet light in the morning and the evening is always preferred or sometimes preferred but as long as a person is intentional in their photos and the way they gather their photos and i I kind of tell people that when we're out in the forest and we're out in the field, we're gadgeting, gathering digital information because really when we're out there and you take a photograph and you're looking at the back of your camera, you're looking at a, a processed photo that the camera did. It's a JPEG preview and it's not necessarily going to represent completely the raw file that when you get home, I always use my histogram. I live and die my, by my histogram. I use it from the moment that I capture the photo because it's going to tell me completely what my exposure is. The preview screen isn't going to, the little blinkies aren't there, aren't going to. The blinkers, they start as soon as the histogram just barely touches that right wall. It doesn't gauge how far up it is or if the highlights have been clipped or not. And you don't want to clip your highlights. So I tell people to balance the histogram to the right, but protect your highlights. And you can live with some darker shadows. There's always going to be digital information and some sort of image in your shadows. But if you clip your highlights, you'll have no digital, digital information in there to be able to recover. So I really pay attention to my histogram because that doesn't lie to me when I want to know what my exposure is. Okay. 
Something else to remember also is that the histogram is going to be reading the process JPEG on the that the camera is using as the preview. And so your histogram most of the time is going to be better when you bring it in, in a, into your software and it starts reading it from your raw file. So I also use my histogram as I'm going through my workflow. So as I'm processing my photo, many times um, I just I just had a workshop and we were working with some folks that had a um, had a way to increase or decrease the brightness of their their monitor. And so if you increase the brightness of your monitor, then your photo is probably going to be processed a little darker. So you want to make sure that your balance, your screen preferably is calibrated. If not, then you want to make sure that it's at around 50% or so, I, in my judgment, to make sure that it's not going to be underexposed or overexposed when you finish your photo. But a good way is to watch that histogram as you go through your workflow. And when you're in Lightroom, you have a way to be able to monitor that histogram as you're going through and processing your photo, as well as in Photoshop. So, so. I've said enough about histograms, but I just can't say enough about histograms. So, okay. So if you're using your histogram and you're out in the field and, you, and it's a really bright, harsh day, there's really no reason why you shouldn't be able to use your histogram to determine whether or not you've got a good um, exposure. If for some reason you're challenging, some cameras are challenged with a broader dynamic range than other cameras are, then Make your histogram will let you know if you need to bracket. So typically, if I need to bracket something, my process is to bracket three shots. A lot of times, that'll be all it is needed. Your your you could bracket five. When I'm in Lightroom, I do just the basic adjustments: lens correction and um, white balance correction. And then also chromatic aberration. A lot of this stuff you can do as it's imported in the Lightroom. And then I will combine the files. So I'll highlight all the files, right click, and hit combine to HDR, come up with a single file and process it. But I, do, I, I, I shoot with the D850. And so my D850 is pretty capable. And I have to bracket less these days than I used to. So, all right. So the light of the day. The photograph on the left was taken in the middle of the day in the redwood forest. And so there were a lot of shadow, a lot of shadows and a lot of uh, highlights in that photograph. And the people that I, I was with, I was with a couple of friends and they were not too enthusiastic about the light in the forest, but I think that photograph came out just fine. And so you can go into the forest and shoot any time of the day. Um, Many times I like to go out when it's raining. That's probably my favorite time to go out. And I'm not saying that going out during the sunny days are preferred or that's the time of the day that I go out the most. Up here in Oregon, we have a lot of rain. And so I like to use the rain to my advantage. Most of the time while it's raining or just after it's rained, Maybe when it's misty. If it's raining really hard, I'll usually wait because it's a hassle to keep your, your lens from fogging up or your gear dry. But I like it when the leaves are all um, wet because I like to use my circular polarizer. I take my circular polarizer. Most of the people are, rec are familiar with circular polarizers because they use them to polarize the sky or they may polarize the surface of water but I also use it to polarize the surface of the leaves in the forest. When they're wet, they have a reflection on them and it reflects the sky and it won't allow the actual color of the leaves um, to come through. And so if the leaf is wet and it's reflecting the light, it's easier to polarize with your circular polarizer. So I would venture to say that most of the use that I get from my circular polarizer is to polarize the forest to allow the the color to come through come come out of the forest 
I also will polarize the surface of a creek to allow maybe some of the color that may be in the sand or the mud or something underneath to come through, but it also will separate the white lines of the movement of the creek in the forest. So if you have a, a glare on top of the water, it's going to uh, cover up a lot of the white streaks that you get that uh, you will use for movement in the creeks that in the waterfalls that you're photographing. So, so do you use the LB neutral circular polarizer in harsh sunlight or just for soft pleasing light? I'll use it whenever I can find that it's going to give me the effect that I want to, that I want. If that makes any sense. <laughs> the circular polarizer is the one filter that I just cannot live without. And while I'm in the forest, there's going to be more times than not that I'm going to be using it to polarize the leaves. A lot of people will not realize just exactly how much of an effect that the polarizer will have on a cloudy day or when the light isn't necessarily striking from 90 degrees or whatever. But I say pull your, uh, pull your polarizer out, put it on and see what it does. There are times when you could be facing in the right direction in the forest where you may not need one and you may not see an effect from it. But sometimes if you turn 90 degrees, uh, you'll, you'll notice that it'll have an effect. So my, um, my Singray LB circular polarizer is something it's, 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 if I leave it at home or anything like that, I'm, it almost, it just ruins my day, <laughs> especially <laughs> if I'm photographing the creeks and waterfalls in the forest. So, yeah, my, that's my favorite filter as well. Um, do you handhold when you're taking bracketing images? Rarely, because I want everything to line up. Right. If I, you know, if my, I'm just, I don't really, you know, I really don't trust my, uh, my hands. It's not like I'm really shaky or anything, but you know, I'm pretty picky on trying to make sure that my focus is good. And if I have to bracket it, then there's, uh, there's a chance that, um, that I will want to uh, make sure that everything lines up. You know, you can, when you bring them in to Photoshop, you can align the layers, but I find it's a lot better if I, if I align them with my tripod first, so. Um, and what did you meter off of in the Redwood shot? Um, I metered off of the highlights. I wanted to make sure that I didn't, um, I didn't blow my highlights out. So I figured that the shadows would come, come around, check the, I will check, I'll, I'll meter at the highlights and then I'll check my shadows and then I'll determine if I have to bracket in this particular case, um, I was able to. Uh, protect my shadows, bring it in in a single um, exposure, and then pull my shadows up in in post. And it's it's kind of a dark dark photo anyhow, except for the highlights and up, up towards the top because we were pretty deep in the forest and the shadows were pretty heavy. So that's kind of how I look at it. Is that I, as as long as I've got my my highlights protected. Um, there's going to be a good chance that I'm going to want to roll with my shadows, shadows anyway, just to make it look more like it, it, it did while I was there. So, okay. The one on the, the photograph on the right was taken during rain. So it was a rainy day in the forest and I had just finished photographing a Creek and I was walking out of the forest and this scene confronted me and I just set my tripod up and took this photograph. So, yeah. It was kind of a dim, diffused light day on. Okay. All right. Now, we were talking about lightness and darkness in the forest. Well, I, I like to use light and dark to be able to create depth in my photos. So in the back, you'll notice in this particular photo, you'll see that that's where the light is coming from. And in the foreground, it's a little darker. So we're going from a darker area into, into a lighter area in the background. 
So that created a depth in the photograph, the disparity in light. It also created a, a bit of, of atmosphere in the photograph. So in this particular case, the, um, the fog and the mist that diffused the light and it created a, this nice atmosphere. Um, on, we had a couple of questions related to that shot. Um, yeah. Someone wanted to know, how do you reduce contrast in the forest? Sunlight area is much brighter than the deep shadows, maybe two exposures? If, if I've got a good histogram, then I won't need two exposures. But if for some reason the dynamic range is so broad, the histogram will tell me. I mean, it will, if I have protected my highlights and the left hand side and the shadow side of the histogram is com completely slammed over to the left hand side of the histogram, then I know that I'm going to want to bracket to be able to recover the shadows and to push my mid mid tones up a bit. So the histogram will tell you, but um, pay attention to the histogram, make sure that you are paying attention to your highlights and that your highlights aren't clipped and your highlights should be able to be recovered in Lightroom. And the way I do that is I will take my highlight slider and I'll bring my highlight slider down. Um, we had a histogram in my last workshop where it was, over, it was up on the left, but it wasn't hitting the wall. And on the right-hand side, it was hitting the right, just barely touching the right-hand side but it was really spiked just to the left of the wall on the histogram. And it just looked like the highlights were completely blown out. But I, my, I had my client, I said, trust me, take the highlight slider in your in Lightroom and pull it down and see if you can recover your highlights. And sure enough, the highlights came in the raw file. It just looked white up there. She pulled her highlights down, trusted her histogram and they came in. So shoot for highlights. Pay attention to the histogram, make sure they're not blown out, and you should be able to do anything that you need with your highlights. And for some reason, after you've protected your highlights and you're not happy with the dark, deep darks on the left-hand side of your histogram, then bracket your shots and combine them in Lightroom. Where is your point of focus in this shot? My, okay, my foreground. Okay, let's talk about focus. This is a great subject. I um i have my own method of of focusing let's call it the gary randall of of bonehead focusing because um i understand i i i implore people to understand hyperfocal distance and what it means but throw away the mathematics okay and understand that the closer you get to your foreground the less depth you're going to have in your focus so you get close to what's called the minimum focus distance of your lens. And the closer you get to that minimum focus distance, the blurrier the background is going to be. So I always do my best to try to come back away from my minimum focus distance in a shot like this one. And then I will focus the lens. I always use manual in, this, in these particular cases. I like to be in control of it. I don't like to trust that a third of the way is, in, is going to give me a, a good foreground or is going to move my focal, uh, my focal plane out as far as it's going to go. So my method is pretty simple. I like to stop down and then I like to bring my preview screen up, magnify my preview screen so that what's in the closest to the lens or the closest to the camera is is showing i focus my lens to infinity which makes my foreground blurry i think you've all witnessed that before and then what i do is i slowly bring it back from infinity until my foreground just comes into focus and then i stop then i'm not pulling any focus behind me or behind where i need it and it's pushing your focal plane out as far as it'll go so if you stop down and don't be afraid to stop down. A lot of people will, you, you know, in landscape photography, we really, really don't worry a lot about lens diffraction. 
because we would rather have to deal with a little bit of lens diffraction than having that area out of focus. So I tell people, what would you rather have? Have a, a little bit of diffraction that is going to be a little bit hard to perceive unless you really magnify into it, look at it, or are you going to want that area to be out of focus? So don't be afraid to stop down. And this is, I'm just talking landscape photography. I'm not necessarily talking about uh, portraiture or street photography. We're talking about landscape photography. So I, tr I, I, I stop down to increase my focal plane as long as possible, deep as possible. I focus to infinity and I pull it just back from infinity, watching my live, my magnified live view to make sure that the foreground just comes into focus, then I stop. In this particular photograph, let me see what I did with this. This one was, where is it, where is it? Where is it? Oh. Here it is. Okay. On this particular one, I didn't really stop down that much. It's F8. But I was able to get a good focus. And I thought, I think that if we were to use the hyperfocal distance calculations, I was probably standing back from my um, foreground far enough to be able to use F8 to be able to push my acceptable focal focus off into the background. One, I'll say one more thing about this as well, is that when you're standing, when you have a photograph up on the wall and some, some a viewer is going up to look at it, the first thing they look at is your foreground and, and they're going to see if it's in focus or not. Now, certainly there are times when a foreground being out of focus or blurry is a good effect, but in this particular case, we want foreground of focus. So if you have the foreground tack sharp and you have the background a little soft it helps to be able to separate the foreground from the background you look at some of the um, the painters the landscape painters Hudson River School maybe Albert Albert Bierstadt some of those people they use the luminance of light and the softness of the background to be able to separate their foreground from the background you can use that method in landscape photography as well can certainly go through and you can bracket or excuse me, you could uh, focus stack these, but I implore people to not use focus stacking as a way to not learn how to focus your photographs properly. So. So one last question on this shot here, when the nearly white waterfall is so small a space in your image, can you see it on the histogram? So I don't blow out the waterfall. Yeah, definitely. That'll be a little, little white, tick on the on the right hand side in time as you go through with your histogram and you go through and you start reading your histogram you can look at your histogram and start picking out little uh, places on the histogram that represent places within your scene you start to be able to um, notice the sky as opposed to uh, uh, a little the waterfall itself, the sky may be blue and the waterfall will be white. The shadows on the right hand or the left hand side, you're going to be able to interpret those as the shadows in your shot. So you'll be able to read that histogram, be able to see all of this stuff in your mind's eye uh, about what it's representing on the histogram. But yeah, anything that's white like this is definitely going to, uh, it's going to show up in there. Okay. I think I covered that. So depth and atmosphere and luminance. We also covered focusing there a little bit too. So that's good. All right. Let's see here. All right. Lightness and darkness. Depth, dark to light, luminosity and darkness. Luminous. And I believe that uh, luminance is a word that's used by painters to describe the, um, the light in their shot, the luminance of their light in their shot in their or their paintings. So you'll notice all of these photos are all using light and dark to create depth in the photograph. Okay. All right. All right, let's talk about the weather. This kind of is uh, 
pretty much the same thing I was talking about earlier about photographing during the daytime, during the bright light. But I like to use the weather to help shape the character and the mood of the photograph. And so there are times when I will go out into the forest in certain conditions because I know it will uh, provide me a certain results that I'm looking for. The most obvious, of course, is going to be snow. If the forest is nice and has some nice fresh snow in it, it's a good time to go out and get those beautiful, beautiful photos. But there are also times when you can go out into the forest where there's fog or a mist in the forest. Or like I mentioned earlier, there are times when you go into the forest and it's wet. You can use your polarizer to be able to bring out a lot of nice vivid colors. The weather, like I said, will give you any, will give you all kinds of different types of, of different effects and, and whatnot. Each, each kind of weather condition will allow you to do different types of, of, of photos. The one on the right of Multnomah Falls was taken on a, on a sunny day in diffused light because it was in an alcove and the sun hadn't quite gotten up over the top of the, the mountain. But that was a sunny day. And the one on the upper left-hand corner up here, that was in a sunny day, on a sunny day. The one in the lower left-hand corner, of course, was on a very cold, frigid day. Oh. And the forest and creeks and waterfalls scenes, scenes are very, very susceptible to um, the weather. You know, it, it's they they really the forest changes in character and atmosphere no matter depending on the weather conditions so all right let's talk about some settings okay all right so let's talk about our creeks and waterfalls first okay um our shutter speeds depend on what we would like typically our water to look like if it's going to be soft and dreamy if it's going to be more uh, textured. We're going to want to do a sh quicker shutter speed. Um, in my photographs, I kind of like to show um, texture in the water, but I also like to have movement in the water. So the best way to describe what I want to talk about here, if I can bring this up, put this over here on this screen. In this particular photograph, this is a, uh, let me see. 0.6 second um, exposure. So I want to increase this and show you what I'm talking about as we're doing this. So because this is less, it's about a half of a second exposure, we haven't completely made our water all um, white and fused together, I guess you could say. We can see streaks through here. You can see movement. This water flows off of here. You can see lines in it. Um, I'm sure I can come down here and find little places where the water splashes up. I don't know if you can see my mouse arrow or not, but there are places where you can actually see where the water is splashing. If you were to expose your water for over a second, a lot of this texture and all of this um, movement would all just go away. Now, excuse me, there are times when that is, is desirable. You may want something that's really nice and smooth. Um, it depends on what you're trying to do. But a lot of people right off the bat, they want to go out and photograph creeks and waterfalls and, and put on like an eight stop neutral density filter, or 10 stop neutral density filter or something like that to be able to slow the water way, way down when you don't really need to. Uh, Sing Ray makes a, a great um, neutral density slash polarizer that gives you, I'm going to, um, I don't own one yet, but I'm going to get one. Um, so I can't remember how many stops it gives you of, of neutral density of shutter, but it's, if you need to do it during bright light, you may need to put a neutral density filter on there to be able to get the smoothness on there. But I tell people to, just try about a half of a second. And a lot of times, if you lower your ISO, and if you were to 
stop down during bright light, a lot of times you can use the couple stops that your circular polarizer gives you a low ISO and stop down to be able to get a half of a second to be able to smooth your water out. So give it a try, see how it looks for you. A quick note on the waterfall filter, it's about four stops. That's what I was thinking, it's about four stops. It's on my wish list and I'm probably <laughs> gonna pick one up soon. There's so been a couple of times it could have come in handy, that's for sure. <laughs> Do you have a favorite shutter speed when shooting waterfalls and creeks, or do you set speed first and then aperture, et cetera? Well, the way I approach it is that um, uh, I like to start out somewhere around a half a second, and then I will work out from there. So I'll set my uh, shutter speed first, and then I'll go through and determine how deep I want the focus of my photo. I'll grab what I think is my optimal aperture. And then I'll bump up my ISO from there to get my uh, exposure. And then I'll see if I need to compromise with my aperture or my shutter speed, depending on the light of the shot. I always make sure that I use my light meter in my camera to be able to set my exposure. And I always check my histogram afterwards. So there are times when the um, light meter could be metering at a different spot that you don't want. Check your histogram. So. And that bottom left photo, did you use a tripod? Yes, all of these I used a tripod. Yeah. Okay. So a person could, in this day and age, I know I, uh, my uh, friend Chris Byrne, his uh, a business partner and my, him and I do workshops together. He has the new Nikon Z9 and the Sony's, I'm sure, have it as well, um, have the in camera stabilization. And he was able to, he was able to hand hold at about a half a second and the focus was really good. So the new cameras this day and age are pretty incredible in their dynamic range, as well as um, their in-camera stabilization. Some of the new lenses are actually pretty well with their stabilization, but, you know, like I say, with my landscape photos, you know, I'm going to use a tripod most of the time. So. I like to be able to get a nice, good, sharp, sharp focus. I don't trust my, you know, so there are times when I will take a photograph by hand, but, you know, we'll go back to some of the photos that I'm taking with my 70 to 200 and not necessarily a photograph where there's movement in the photo. That makes sense. Okay. All right. Let's see here. All right, now let's talk about forests. And forests are standard, you know, they're pretty, pretty standard. It'll depend on your shutter speed is gonna depend on movement. If for some reason there are leaves that are moving in, in the forest, you're gonna to wanna to make sure your shutter speed is fast enough to be able to freeze them. Um, photographing leaves that are moving in the forest are no different than photographing um, birds that are flying or anything else that's, that's moving. You want to be able to freeze it. So you want to make sure that you've got a fast enough shutter speed. And then the next thing you want to do is make sure that your aperture is giving you the depth that you need. You can compromise on your aperture, open it up more if you're not shooting a very deep, deep focus. Okay. Like I like I had mentioned earlier in, in the, the presentation here, if you're shooting off into the distance, you're not necessarily getting the foreground off into the background, you can compromise sometimes on your aperture and open it up a bit more. But you're gonna wanna be able to make sure that you have a, you stop down if you've got a photograph where you wanna make sure that the foreground, the one up on the upper left-hand side is, um, that's fairly close and I used a, uh, Tamron 17 to 35 wide angle lens for that one. Wide angle, ultra wide angle lenses are usually pretty forgiving in focus, but I still used a tripod on that one. Stop down on that to, let me see here. I'll bring that one up to, uh, where are you at? That one, I stopped down to, well, it was at F8 and uh, I was at ISO 64 at a quarter second. So if you look in the distance in that, all we're doing is 
um, dealing with forests that's maybe 25 or 30 feet away. We're not dealing with a, f a foreground that's really close with a mountain that's off into the distance or something. So F8 was able to give, give me an acceptable focus. The rest of these were all basically taken with a longer lens. This one on the upper right-hand side of the Redwoods, um, like I said, I believe that one was, yeah, that one I had stopped down to F18 to block light because it was a very bright day. And that was two and a half seconds, ISO 200. I'm not sure why I gave it such a long, long exposure, probably because I stopped down to F18 and lowered my ISO to 200. That looks like fog coming through the forest, but that was during a bright sunny day. It was uh, about eight o'clock in the morning and there was no fog there, but a, a car had driven down the road behind us and set dust off into the woods and kind of made it look like fog. So don't trust anything or everything that a photograph says to you, that's not fog. The one on the lower left-hand corner there was uh, taken off into the distance. That one was, let me see, I thought I separated all these. That one was probably 200 millimeter if I'm not mistaken. So I'm not finding it right now. So not... is there any reason you have two competing mid-range zooms? Pardon me? Is there any reason you have two competing mid-range zooms? Um, you're probably looking over here at the Nikon and Tamron. These are different eras. So um, I shot with the D3. Whoops. So let me go back to that one. I shot with the D3 first, and then I got rid of that one, and I've shot with the D810, and that was I was shooting with the 24 to 85 at the time, 3.5. And then... When I went with my D850, I went with a Tamron 24 to 728. So these are all different eras of when I took these photographs. So that's that explains that. That makes sense. Okay. All right. We're moving right along here. We're almost done. Um, tools, other than your camera, we'll talk about tripod, shutter release, and filters. Okay. This is my friend Chris Byrne in a beautiful mossy grotto that's in the Mount Hood National Forest. I'm a mossaholic, so, okay. All right, I am asked a lot about tripods. And in my estimation, I have probably purchased twice as many tripods as it would have taken for me to be able to just buy one good one in the very beginning. I've done my best to try to save money on tripods and they've always let me down when I needed them the most. They've always fallen apart or just haven't performed the way that I needed. And so one of the best investments in, in my life has been my tripod. I bought a very very good tripod and uh, I like it a lot. It's sturdy, it's um, repairable. If for some reason I need to repair it, I can fix it. Um, it's uh, sturdy, it'll last forever. It's a good quality tripod. It'll last me for the rest of my life. And I think that if I was half my age, it would still last me for the rest of my life. So it's really, um, it's really easy to think that maybe, you know, you spend, quite a bit on your camera, you can just compromise in your tripod. But when you're wanting to use a tripod, if you don't have a sturdy tripod and you're in a creek, the water going past the legs of your tripod are going to shake the tripod. If you're out there during a windy day, the wind can shake your tripod. You want to make sure your tripod is steady. So you don't want to just have to deal with, with leaves that are moving in your scene. You know, you don't want to deal with a shaky tripod either. So that makes sense. My best advice is to get a good tripod, okay? Um, typically, my rule of thumb, I've kind of already covered when I would use a tripod and when I wouldn't. But generally speaking, use a tripod when you need to extend your shutter speed. 
Use your tripod if you need, if there's movement in the photograph that you want to um, ex ex accentuate, like the, the movement in the water or movement in the tripod or the waterfall, you want to make sure that you set your tripod and your camera up steady so that you can, you can capture that. Um, focus stacking and bracketing, all that stuff will need a tripod. Um, if you think that you can get your photograph handheld with fast enough shutter speed without causing um, motion blur in your photograph, then certainly bring your, um, bring your uh, um, camera off your tripod, take your camera off the tripod, handhold it, but make sure that your shutter speed is fast enough to overcome any kind of movement in your hands or anything that, uh, that you might, you know, any kind of movement that you might cause the camera and the lens. So that's pretty much my tripod uh, deal. Um, we do have another question regarding um, sort of other tools besides your camera. Um, yeah. When you're standing in a creek, river, or lake, do you use knee or chest waders? And if so, do you like a specific brand? Depends on how cold the water is. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, as a matter of fact, um, I do. Uh, I have, um, I do use waders. Um, I like to backpack. And so a real struggle for me was to try to find a uh, set of waders that weren't bulky and heavy. Um, most of the fly fishing waders that a lot of people will want to use are, you know, they're chest waders or something with, with boots that go on them and, and whatnot. But um, I need to become an affiliate for Wiggy's Waders. W-I-G-G-Y apostrophe S, I believe. Wiggy's Waders. And they're not real sturdy, but they're easily repairable with like Gorilla Tape. And they roll up and they go in your camera backpack. And I absolutely love them. They're kind of grippy on the bottom. They're kind of baggy. You put them on your legs. They got straps that will strap to your belt or your belt loop or your pants up here to hold them up. And I just love them called Wiggy's Waders. And so those are my Creek Waders. And I use them quite a bit. And uh, like I said before, they're, um, um, they're not, they're pretty durable. I haven't really had a problem with, um, with uh, holes in them, but there was one day that I did get, get a hole in them out in the field. I must've hit a stick or something and it got a hole in them. So um, when I brought them home, I brought them home and filled them up with water and found out where the hole was, emptied them out, dried them off, and I put a piece of Gorilla Tape on there. And that Gorilla Tape has stayed on there ever since, and it's been probably a year and a half. So they're pretty easy to repair if you need to, and they work really, really good. And uh, I think they cost somewhere around $75 or $80, if I remember right. So that's what I recommend. And then back to tripods. Do you turn off your lens stabilizer with your camera on a tripod? Definitely. Always always. Otherwise, um, if you're on a tripod and there's anything moving in, in, in the background or out where you're trying to take a photograph, a lot of times the vibration reduction will want to move with that. And you want everything to completely still in the photo. So it'll cause movement. It'll cause blur in your photo if you don't take it off of vibration reduction. So, and what okay. tripod do you use? I have a uh, really right stuff. I'm trying to remember the model number, but yeah, I bought a uh, really right stuff and a BH 55 um, ball head. It's kind of large, but it's, um, it's not that bad. It's not something that I would take on a five day backpack packing trip, but I've carted all over the place on all of my day trips and it works really, really well. So I like my really right stuff tripod a lot. So I also want to um, point out that I teach a lot of people in the field and I am around a lot of landscape photographers that use tripods and uh, a common practice or a, a, a mistake that a lot of photographers do with their tripods is set them up and they'll be set at an angle. Make sure your tripod is set up perpendicular. Take that extra few seconds to be able to make sure your tripod is straight up and down. Uh, it'll keep it from falling over, number one. And a lot of people will set their tripod up and it's kind of at an angle, you know, and they'll put their hand on it while they're taking a photograph. And 
putting your hand on it kind of defeats the purpose of having it on a tripod. So set the tripod up, take your time. You may have to set the legs separately or prop one out to stabilize it, but make sure that you're perpendicular to the earth and your camera is nice and level. So um, I also um, have a tripod that doesn't have a center column on it. That way I can get low, lower to the ground that way. If you've got a center column, when it's down, it will get in the way of you lowering your tripod. And a lot of times if you've got a center column, you're gonna be tempted to raise it up. Whenever you raise your center column up, it makes it very unstable. So my tri tripods don't have a center column on them. So um, another piece of gear that I- Oh, one more question on tripods. Do you certainly. prefer a ball head to gimbal? Um, for landscape photography, ball head is just fine. A gimbal is really good if you're using a long lens for wildlife. But uh, I have a friend that uses a gimbal on his um, landscape photos, but I, I just use a, uh, what I use is a ball head that's also a panning head. So that's kind of how I look at that. You know, you're going to want to use a gimbal if you've got a long lens and you're moving it and trying to watch, follow birds and whatnot, and moving it around. But I like to take my ball head, get everything set up, lock it down and use my shutter release. I always like to make sure I have a shutter release on my camera. Um, a lot of times if you're shooting with a timer, uh, you may, you may miss something in the shot or something like that. So a lot of times if, if you get everything all set up and get it all set, most of the time a shutter release is really going to help you. You'll be surprised, especially on the higher resolution cameras, how much you just pushing the shutter release may cause a little bit of, of motion blur in your, in your photos. So. Okay. All right. All right. Lens filters. Circular polarizer is a must have when I'm doing forest photos, especially creeks and waterfalls. Neutral density filters will help me during brighter times, but a lot of times um, I'm there in a dimmer time of the day. Um, I like to go out in the morning, I like to get out there when it's when the when the light is just starting in the forest. And a lot of times, there's not a lot of people out there, and um, you don't have to worry a whole lot with um, you know. You can just spend your spend your day out there. Um, I don't know where I was going with that, but my uh, neutral density filters. Oh, I know what I was going to say. I get out there in the morning and a lot of times my neutral density filter stays in my bags because um, I've got enough light or a dim light to be able to get the shutter speeds that I need. And like I said earlier, if I'm only going to be using a half of a second or something like that, then don't need to you know extend it a lot further than that. I don't need an, a um, neutral density filter. So if you're shooting in the conditions that you want, then you probably won't need a grad filter. For some reason, you show up there late that day and you want to get a little bit of smooth water effect, then you're going to want to put your neutral density filter on, okay? All right. Um, graduated neutral density filters. I have a whole set of grad filters and there are times when I will use them, but there are times when um, they bother me a little bit. Um, in this day and age, uh, if you're able to grab a good histogram, then a lot of times you won't need to knock the sky down with a grad filter. A grad filter a lot of times will cover up areas in your photograph that you don't want dimmer than, than it actually is. You may just want the, the sky cut down, but not the, the hills or the trees or whatnot. You can always go in there with a graduated filter um, in post sometimes and do some correction if you do use a grad filter and you've knocked some of uh, the shadows down a little bit further. Um, a lot of times if you don't use a grad filter properly, you can have what I call a grad line in your photo. And so grad filters are really uh, handy. If you've got a really bright sky, you need to knock your sky down. But um, a lot of times if you use, if you go by your histogram, you've got a really good histogram 
you probably won't need your grad filter. So um, that's that's kind of it as far as filters are concerned. If does anybody have any questions about filters at all? Actually, yeah. We had um, someone ask, can you address how effective ND filters are at reducing a high dynamic range settings, such as with bright sun streaks and dark shadowed forest scenes? Well, a neutral density filter is going to affect them all because the neutral density filter is going to be global. So if it's going to be knocking down the highlights in the, in the photograph, it's also going to be knocking down the shadows. So the neutral density filter isn't going to be able to separate the two. It's going to be a global um, effect on the photograph itself. I don't know if that answered the question or not. Yeah, it's right. not going to affect that. Um, it's going to just dim. It's going to dim your photograph is what it's going to do. Or it's, it's, and that's all it's going to do. All it's doing is making it a little bit darker. So, right. And that's, it, that's, that's in my world, unless there's some sort of technology or some sort of science that I'm unaware of. So. And do you use a polarizer on an ultra wide lens? If so, how do you prevent vignetting? Um, I do. Um, a circular polarizer is going to have a natural area where it's going to, it's going to polarize more than another. And so you, you'll look at a scene and you'll use your polarizer to either polarize the foreground, or you may turn it around to where it's going to be polarizing the sky and probably not both. A lot of times you can get a polarizer with a step up ring and kind of eliminate a little bit of that but i have uh the 17 to 35 tokina and my sing ray um lb neutral density or excuse me neutral circular polarizer is really good at not having that super icky blob and i'm i'm convinced that the the less expensive polarizers have more of a problem with that zonal area of polarization. So um, I don't really deal with it a lot, but when I do deal with it, I always just move it around to where it's going to polarize the area that I want. And if you think about it, when you're out there, most of the time you're not really polarizing the whole thing necessarily. I mean, you may if you're polarizing the whole forest, but there's going to be zones that you're going to want to be able to polarize and won't necessarily need to polarize in other areas. And so if I have, if I am challenged by that, that's typically how I, I go for that. So if I need to use a circular polarizer, so yeah. And then someone yeah. suggested using an oversized CP. Right. Um, yeah, that's what I was saying earlier is that if you use a step up ring, Mm -hmm. You can uh, use a larger circular polarizer and then, yeah, and then like handle that a little bit more. So, yeah. yeah, that's really common. And I, I did that for a long time. Um, but the, um, the, the wide angle, ultra wide angle lens that I have doesn't have a real bulbous um, um, element in the front. And so it's got a nice screw on filter. And it's a smaller one, and I don't seem to have that spread and that disparity in my, in my, and I don't nearly have that problem as much as I used to, as I, I guess what I'm trying to say. I, I, I love my, my uh, Singray filters. It seems like since I've gone to Singray filters, a lot of the little things that used to bug me about filters have kind of gone away. So, and that's, that's one of them. And it may have to do with the, the polarizer or the, the lens and the, uh, the filter combination that I'm using as well. So, yeah, but it's, it's definitely something to consider. And then someone wanted to know what's your opinion on variable neutral density filters? Um, I think they're pretty good for video. I think that they have a, um, um, a little bit of a, a problem. The ones, at least the one that I had, and it wasn't a sing ray, the one that I had, it had a real problem with the blob moving around in it for some reason. I just didn't really care for it. And that doesn't mean that I didn't, you know, that I had, didn't have a good one. But uh, I, I use them, I've used them for video more than I have for, um, for photography. But like I said before, I, I don't use um, 
neutral density filters all that often. So it has to be a situation where I can't control my exposure with my my ISO and my aperture and my shutter, shutter speed. For some reason, I have to be able to knock light down. Then I'll go for a, a circular, uh, excuse me, a neutral density filter. But I don't really rely on them that much. Right. And then another comment: the darkened sky in a wide-angle CP shot will be uneven due to the angles at which the CP works. Yeah. Well, it could. For sure, it depends. You know, the uh, the angle of attack of the light is definitely something to consider. But um, I just, I'm I'm real visual. I just put it on, and I'll turn it around, see how it affects it. If I like it, great. If I don't, take it off. You know, so yeah, I just I just see how it works for me, and then I go from there. Right. Yeah. yeah. Hope that helps. I, you know, I, I tell people if, if photography were required me to know a lot of mathematics, I'd be a C minus photographer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me see here. All right, processing. Um, what I like to do here is uh, bring up my Lightroom here real quick. And I wanna just go through a couple things real fast and kind of show you a little bit of what I do with some of my processing. So, and I'm not gonna show you anything real complicated. Everything is usually pretty basic here. So I use um, Lightroom for 90% of uh, what I do with my photos. So let me move this over here. And I've got a photo on here. Oh boy, that's ugly. Let me see here. It's made making everything bigger, funky. All right, let's see if I can get this worked out here. Close this out over here. Okay. Oh, come on. All right, there. All right, this is kind of out of scale, but you can see I've got my histogram over here. Everything's kind of big and my preview screen is doing this to me here. So um, I like to keep an eye on my histogram, but because right now it's kind of invading my, my workspace, I'm gonna move it up here, okay? First thing I go through, do I go through with um, my lens corrections, make sure my Cobrac chromatic aberration is clicked and my enable profile corrections is clicked. I don't always click this. I always make sh look at it and see if it's doing what I want to. Most of the time it corrects for, excuse me, barrel distortion and um, vignetting. Okay. Then after that, I go up here because I shoot in um, uh, my photos uh, in auto white balance. I'll come up here and I might click on here to see if anything's gonna change if I change the auto or whatnot. I will also sometimes come up here and choose maybe a different uh, profile. A lot of these will reflect the profiles that you have in your camera. Your camera will pro process the JPEG too. So a lot of times if you click through here and click on some of these, it'll do a lot of your processing for you. I like to typically start out with um, a standard profile. So let me get this up here too. And move this over, maybe this will help. Everything being kind of out of shape has kind of got me a little unnerved. All right, so I come down and I was talking earlier about bringing my highlights down. Now, if you notice my uh, waterfall here, whoops, well, all right. You'll notice that there's still some texture in there. You can notice my histogram. I've come over to the right, but I haven't really touched, protected my highlights. So we were talking about bringing the highlight slider down to recover um, texture in your water. And you'll notice here how the water, all the texture of the movement of the water comes as I pull the highlights down. Sometimes I'll pull my shadows up like I was talking earlier. For some reason, I want to even my histogram out on the left side. If it's all pushed all the way over to the left, I might lean on my sh shadows a little bit to pull my shadows up a little. 
Okay. There are times also where I will come through here and use my uh, my uh, brushes, like the this brush up here, to come through here and maybe do some zonal adjustments up here. I may use my linear gradient to come through here. We were talking about a grad filter. There's your grad filter. You can use this over the top of a, if you used a grad filter in the field and you just wanted to affect the area that you used your grad filter on, you can match the grad filter that you created with your filter in the field with this particular one here for some reason you wanted to too, which I've had to do before in the past, so. All right, so let's take that one off. I'll come down through and um, after I've, this is, a, this is such a good photo though. I mean, it's the histogram is really, really good. It's not really taking a lot of adjustment. Um, I'll make my final um, adjustments with my uh, tone curve. A lot of times what I've done in my basic module up here, Will kind of flatten the the um, photo out a little bit so a lot of times i'll come through here and then create maybe an s curve a very slight s curve in here if you want to see how this is affecting it you can turn it on and off with this little switch here okay so i want to protect my highlights a little bit more now when i've got all these adjustments done in here i might bring it into lightroom as a smart object. I want to show you a couple things in <clears throat> Lightroom that are, excuse me, Photoshop that I do. And then we'll be done. I'm going to take a minute for Photoshop to fire up. And then I'll drag it over here. While we're waiting, have you ever used Photo Lab 5? I have not. Tell you what, there's a lot of good software out there. I kind of got myself in a rut. I've been using Photoshop for almost 20 years now. And so I kind of got myself in a rut. I do use maybe on one every now and then. Um, I've used some other software, but um, I just really like my, my uh, workflow that I have with my Adobe products. So, but a lot of this stuff can be, uh, it, it can be emulated with uh, other, uh, all right, here we are, with other software, okay? But I do everything manually, everything that I do, you know, I don't use, a, I don't use plugins and stuff. I do make my own actions. So a lot of the stuff that I'm showing you, um, I have an action for up here. So I'm not going to use the action. I'm going to actually show you how to do it. Okay. All right. So the first thing I'm going to show you how to do is, um, is the dodging burning methods that I use. Okay. So I'll create a 50% gray layer by hitting alt or option on my keyboard and clicking a new layer. This new layer dialog box comes up. I switch this to soft light and fill with 50% gray. So we're going to be recording this, so you can go back and look at this later on if you needed to, okay? Now, I've got different tools that I can use here. I can use my dodge and burn tools here if I cared to, which I may do every now and then, but a lot of times I'll just use my brush tool. So what I'm going to show you right now is my brush tool with white and black on a 50 cent gray layer, okay? So I'm going to use a soft brush right here, my hardness is way, way up, okay? I'm gonna make this big, er, by use my bracket keys, okay? And I can come in here, and what I'm gonna do is shape the light in this photo. I will use white on this 50 cent gray layer up here on the top to create a light bleed in here. I can create another 50 cent gray layer here and use my black. And then I can come through here and maybe create a partial 
vignette down here. Okay. Now, if I turn these off and on, you can see just in two moves, I've created depth in the photo. Let me make this larger so you can see it. Okay. Now, I've we were talking earlier about creating going from darker to light by just doing these two moves i've created depth i hope everybody can see that okay so you can also go through with different areas i'll take my my white brush all right and i'll come down to a little area down here and if for some reason i want to lighten this area up up here you can see how it's over over affected it, I can come to edit, fade brush tool, and I can bring this over here. I can fade the effect, okay? So I've put that light down there. I've created, I've gone to zero opacity and I can bring it up to where I want it, all right? Now I've basically brought it up to 20% and I'm gonna hit okay. So I've dodged, that little area down there started out at 100%. I went to edit, fade brush tool, and I faded it to 20%. So that allow you to be able to isolate different zones and areas in your photograph and to be able to affect it without having to either affect the opacity of your brush or the opacity of the layer. A lot of times, a lot of people will do this 100% and then adjust the opacity of their layer, where if you do it this way, you can do several areas or several zones that are of a different effect. So some could be at 100%, some could be down to 20%, and you can shape the light in your photograph doing that, okay? All right, so now we're going to hit uh, Control-Alt-Shift-E, and I can't remember what they call that, but they got this. All right, come on. And that's going to create a layer that has all of the stuff that we've done to it. All right. Now I'm going to show you how I create my Orton effect, and then we'll be almost done with this. Okay. A lot of times uh, in forest photography, we'd like to create this misty and ethereal feel. And at least I do in my photos. I like to um, do a little bit of it, but I don't like to get too carried away with it. But I'll show you how I do it. So, I will create this merged layer. I'll come to image, apply image. I'll, where's my little box here? Everything's, I got two screens going here. So I leave all of these in their default settings. I hit okay. Then I come over here and I'll change this to soft light. And I'll come up here to blur. And I will go to a Gaussian blur. And I will take my box and I will vary this according to what I think that I would like for this light. What this is doing is this is adjusting it according to the luminance of the photo. So it'll either be more concentrated in the shadows or more, more, um, more, what do I want to fade it away from the shadows into the light. And I like to bring it up somewhere in here. And basically what I'm doing now is I am creating deeper colors without changing my um, saturation or my contrast. Then I will do this again, Control Shift Alt E. Come on. Uh, there we go. So I will stamp that layer. I'll come up here and do this again. Apply image, turns it really dark. But this time around, I'm going to take and turn this to screen blend mode. All right. So the one below is soft light blend mode. This one's screen blend mode. Then I come up with my filter. I'll adjust my, my uh, Gaussian blur. And you can see how you can adjust the mistiness of it. I'll bring it up to where it's really kind of misty. Hit OK. And these can be done with smart objects too, but I'll save that for another, another situation. Now I'll come down here, and this is a time where I will vary the 
the opacity of these layers. And I'll bring it up until I think I've got the contrast and the saturation that I need in that. And then I'll vary this one here as well. I'll bring this up to where I think I've got a little bit of mist. Okay. All right. And then if I feel that I need to do any more adjustment, then I may do another 50% um, gray layer, may do some more adjustment. But if I like it, which I might like it on this one, I will either flatten it. If I think I'm completely done, I'll flatten the, the layer. And a lot of times I'll duplicate the layer. Hit OK. And the way I like to sharpen these, because now what we've done is we basically have created this Orton effect that is kind of diffuse the photograph. We want to go back in and, and sharpen it. So the way I like to sharpen, I go to uh, filter, sharpen, and smart sharpen. There are other ways to sharpen, um, but I'd like to use this method simply because it allows you to be able to affect how it's sharpened. Let's just sharpen these guys here. You can affect how much it's sharpened, the radius of how it's sharpened, which is how, how thick the edges are going to be, which is going to be make it a little more crunchiness in here. But it also allows you to be able to reduce noise. So a lot of times when you come in and sharpen your photograph, it introduces a little bit of noise and you're able to go through and maybe take some away. So this allows you to be able to balance your sharpening and your noise reduction, then hit OK. And so we have gone through and essentially done my whole workflow as far as processing these photos are concerned. And that's basically it. Does anybody have any questions about that? And like I said, this is basic. This is, this is where I start, but uh, it can go on the, from there. We can create luminosity selections and then just do these adjustments according to the luminosity selections that we do. And, uh, but the, the um, process is essentially the same. All you're doing at that point is just um, choosing areas of the photograph that you're affecting. So does that make sense to everybody? I hope that's not, I hope that's what everybody expected anyhow. No questions on that, but I have a couple of questions I've been holding on to for a while. Great, let's do it. Um, someone wanted to know, how do you deal with slippery rocks? <laughs> I'm very careful. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> um, the, um, the bottoms of the Wiggy Waders have got this grid on them that are pretty, pretty good. But um, there are a lot of times when you just have to be very careful. And I use my tripod as a staff to kind of steady myself until I get to where I need to go. But that doesn't mean that I haven't fallen on my butt a few times. So just got to be very careful. Yeah, be careful. And then the, this uh, question, I think refers back to your like first three or four slides. Mm -hmm. um, the shot that was horizontal versus vertical, could you have changed to a bigger millimeter and capture the foreground? Um, certainly, but you're also going to be including more on the sides in, 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 as well. So you're going to be going with a wider angle lens and including more and more in your shot where I have a tendency to use my wide angle lens and exclude more of the shot. Okay. So when I move it uh, to a vertical, um, I'm, I'm basically eliminating uh, more of the shot than I would if I were to shoot a very wide one, you know, if that right. makes sense. I'm isolating the, the foreground more than it would be if it was including uh, a real broad view of the whole scene. So it's, it's, it's reducing it down to what is the most important in the photograph. So that and then sense. a question about your processing. When you do your 50% gray, are you always going to soft light and blend mode to dodge and burn? Yes. Yeah. Yep. That's what gives me um, the, the, the smoothest and the best effect according to the brightness of the, the photograph. So. 
Okay. If there are any other questions, get them in now. Um, I do want to let you know the Singray website is down. We're going to send everyone a recording and a special discount code that's only going to the people who registered to the webinar. Um, we're going to send that out in the morning. The website will be up tomorrow, um, but we wanted to let you know we're aware it's down um, and we're working on it. I crashed the website. <laughs> we broke the internet. Um, I broke the internet. <laughs> And then Sandy says she missed the hardness of the brush. Um, usually when I'm usually when I'm dodging and burning, I use a very soft brush, 0% softness. There are times when I may want to refine the edge so that it isn't necessarily being uh, dodged or burned into another area. But generally speaking, I use a nice soft brush. I think that's it for our questions. Um, so I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us tonight. I want to thank you, Gary, for presenting today. It's been a treat to have you. We've had great questions from the audience, and I've had a lot of fun learning today. I've had a great time. I'm always happy to help. So if there's anybody that has any questions afterwards, uh, get a hold of me so sometimes i'm out in the field and i don't get a hold or get back to you right away but uh yeah persist and i'll always answer your questions happy to always glad to help definitely all right well everybody have a great night and hopefully we'll see you again next month thanks